Hi, this is Tamara Kelly from Moogly, and I am live today on the Yarnspirations Facebook page. I want to thank you so much for joining me for today's Lunch and Learn. Since we are live, I want to take just a moment to refresh my laptop in front of me here so that I can see your comments and questions as we go. So let me just take a couple of clicks here. And there we go. We are up and running. So once again, thank you so much for joining me. I'm Tamara from Moogly. And today we are going to be talking about the Karen Tunisian Full Stitch Crochet Blanket. Long name, a beautiful project. Here is the pattern that we're going to be making today. Uh, hopefully that's Hopefully that's focusing in well for you. If not, there's plenty of links here in the description, and they'll be dropping those into the chat as well. Um, it is just a really fun Tunisian crochet pattern. It's great if you've never even done Tunisian before. This is a big project, certainly, to jump into, but today we're going to be making a small sample. So even if you've never done Tunisian crochet before, I encourage you to go ahead and give this one a try. Now, to make a Tunisian blanket like we're talking about today, Typically, you need what's called a Tunisian crochet hook. It's going to be like a standard crochet hook, but when it's for an afghan like this, it'll have a long cord attached to the end. Here's an example of a straight Tunisian crochet hook. This is one I bought over a decade ago on Amazon. It's unfortunately no longer um, available for sale, but this is this one wouldn't be work well for an afghan. Maybe for a baby blanket, I could squish enough loops on here. But for a full-size blanket, you're want, going to want to get a Tunisian crochet hook that looks like a crochet hook but has a long cord on the end. This is to help push all those loops off onto as you're making the Tunisian rows. It'll make a little bit more sense in a minute. Now, odds are, if you've never done Tunisian crochet before, you don't have a Tunisian hook laying around. Certainly not in the 8 millimeter size that we are going to be using today. So instead, what I want you to do is grab the straightest... 8 millimeter crochet hook that you have, probably something like a Susan Bates. You want something without a decorative handle so that it's as straight as it can be. You won't be able to make the full blanket size on there, but you can certainly take a few stitches and learn this technique. One of the great things about this project is that it is made all in one stitch. So stitch count itself doesn't matter. It's just like if it was made with single crochets or half double crochets, you can crochet however many you want. So for today, to learn this stitch, go ahead and start with just five, six, whatever foot fits on your little short hook. So let's go ahead and go to the overhand camera here so we can take a closer look at what we're making today. Alrighty, here we are. Here is another look at that pattern, probably a little bit more in focus. And one of the interesting things about this particular pattern, it's kind of hard to tell in this picture, but it's actually worked this direction. And then the fringe is added onto the sides of the project. So it's actually kind of worked lengthwise. You can see here is a small swatch that I worked up yesterday to practice a little bit. Although I crocheted this direction, the finished blanket would go this way with the fringe on either side, so to speak. Another interesting thing about Tunisian crochet, besides the unusual hook needed, and that you have lots of loops, is that it does tend to curl. And you can see here on my little swatch, it is trying very hard to curl up like this. This is what the back of it looks like. And this is the right side that looks like the weaving that we get, the woven look, I should say, that we get with the Tunisian full stitch. So with patterns like this, there's a few different things you can do to combat this curl. Blocking certainly helps quite a bit. I have not blocked this small swatch. But in this pattern, they also add just a little bit of standard double crochet on either end that then gets folded over and sewn down. So as an extra supply for this particular project, you want to have what they call T-pins or blocking pins. I have a couple different kind here that I like to use. Um, they're all mixed up here. Here's some U-pins that I like to use quite a bit. But specifically, this is what a T-pin looks like right here. You want to make sure anytime you get pins like this for blocking your crochet or knit projects that they are stainless steel and rust proof because there's nothing worse than getting your project all blocked out, get it wet, get it pinned out, and then have your pins rust on you and leave little ruts, rust spots on your project. So if you just choose to add those side pieces, you'll want to probably go ahead and pick up some pins to help you with that. So with all that said, all our prep here, we've got all our stuff ready. We're going to be using Karen Jumbo Ombre. And then for this pattern, they also use some Karen One Pound. 
You can see here one shade of ombre and three shades of the one pound. And then, since it's always important to read our pattern ahead of time, I also want to point out whoop, that this pattern works one to three rows at a time in each color, switching colors quite often. So today in our Lunch and Learn here, I really want to focus primarily on getting the Tunisian full stitch figured out. But if there's time, we'll try and add a little bit of color changes as well. So I don't have the colors that actually call for in the pattern, but of course, that's the fun thing about crochet, knitting, Tunisian crochet. You pick your own colors and make it your own. So I'll be using the Karen Jumbo in white water. Got my end already started here. And let's go ahead and take a few stitches. To start our Tunisian crochet project, let me get my instructions here somewhere where I can read them as well. What we want to do is it says to chain 150 loosely. Now this is to make a 55 inch wide blanket. Obviously we don't have time for that today over lunch. So I'm just going to go ahead and chain a few stitches here. Again, if you're working with a shorter hook, just chain as many as you think might fit comfortably on your hook. Probably, probably no more than 10 or 12. So there's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. That sounds pretty good for me too. There we go. Now, these are all standard chains. So far, just like standard crochet. For Tunisian though, this is where it gets a little different. Each row is made of two passes. There's a forward pass where you pick up loops and a return pass where you work those loops back off. So each row, at the end of each row, you will have worked across the row twice and end up with one loop left back on your hook. Let's go ahead and do our first forward pass. This is gonna be a foundation row. This is kind of a standard first row in Tunisian. We'll get to the Tunisian full stitch on the next row. So what we want to do is we're going to be working into the underneath loops of the chain. When you work into your chain, you might be used to working under the top two loops, that top V. For Tunisian, we really want to work into that back hump. It's just going to be a whole lot easier here. We want to skip the chain closest to the hook, go to the second chain, go under that back loop, yarn over and pull up a loop, but now we're not going to yarn over again or finish a stitch. We're just going to leave that loop right on our hook. And we're going to continue to do that all the way across. Go to the next chain, yarn over, and pull up a loop. Next chain, yarn over, and pull up a loop. We're going to do that all the way across. So however many stitches you chained, you should end up with that same number of stitches, or loops rather, on your hook at the end of this forward pass. We just go into each chain and pull up a loop. This is where it might remind you a little bit of knitting. And if you watch a lot of my tutorials, you'll notice I'm not holding my hook the way I usually do. Usually when I crochet, I crochet like this. With Tunisian, you end up switching to an overhand hold on your hook. Sort of like we tend to hold our knitting needles. So here we've worked all the way across. I've got that last chain. And I just wanna go in there and pull up a loop. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve loops on my hook. And I chained 12. So if you chained 150 for that whole blanket, you would end up with 150 loops on your hook at the end of your first forward pass. Now, when I showed you our swatch, you notice the front and the back look very different. With Tunisian, we don't turn our work. We're always going to be working from this side. So now we're going to work all these loops off until we have just one loop left on our hook. And the way we work our standard return pass is we yarn over and we're going to pull up through just that first loop, sort of like a chain one, if you will. Then we're going to yarn over and pull through two loops. Yarn over and pull through two loops. Oh, except I grabbed the wrong end, didn't I? That'll happen, whoops. Let me pull all that out. Easy mistake to make there. I grabbed the wrong thread at the end. Let's go ahead and put those last few stitches back on our hook. Just like crochet, we can just go ahead and pull out that end to frog our stitches or pull out our stitches and undo our work. There we go. 
Now I've got the correct strand in my hand. Get that straightened out there. And now we can start that return pass. We're going to yarn over and pull through just that first loop. Then yarn over and pull through two. Yarn over and pull through two. Yarn over and pull through two. And we continue that all the way across until just one loop is left on our hook. Again, it doesn't matter what number you actually started with. Whatever fits comfortably on the hook you are using today to try and learn this technique with. We're down to our last two loops. So when we yarn over and pull through two, we have one loop left on our hook and our foundation row is complete. We've made a foundation row of Tunisian crochet. So now I need to change the page here on our instructions. And now with our second row is where we're actually going to begin making the Tunisian full stitch. The Tunisian full stitch is one of the simpler Tunisian stitches, but you do need to kind of watch where you're at and keep track because we're going to be working it a little differently in our even numbered rows and our odd numbered rows. Let's start with row two. First thing we're going to do is look for the space between our stitches. Now, if this is your first time doing Tunisian crochet, you might say, okay, where's a stitch in this one? Well, let me pull this loop up out of the way a little bit so we can look at it. For Tunisian crochet, each stitch, normally what we're thinking about is these two uh, vertical, that's the word I'm looking for, vertical loops right here. Not the horizontal ones, we want to look at these two vertical loops. Each one of those sort of represents a stitch. And then you can see there's some loops around the top of it, but generally it's those two vertical loops that we pay attention to in Tunisian crochet. There are exceptions, of course, it's crochet. Somebody's always inventing a new stitch, but those are the ones we want to look for. For the Tunisian full stitch, we're not going to be working into either of those loops. We're actually going to put our hook right between those two stitches. So here's our first stitch and there's our second stitch. We don't need to chain or anything first. We've already got our loop on our hook and with Tunisian, that counts. So we're just going to put our hook right between those two stitches all the way to the back there, yarn over and pull up a loop. Now with Tunisian crochet, I talked a little bit about that curling. You wanna make sure to really pull those stitches up, pull those loops up onto your hook, try and pull that to the top of your fabric a little bit. That will help combat the curling a little bit as well. Then we continue on across. You can see here's the next stitch and there's the stitch after that. So we wanna put our hook right in between them. So we can yarn over and pull up a loop. And again, we wanna pull that up nice and high. You can see that whole stitch there is in between each one. So as we pull it apart, you can see that great big white space. That's where we want to go with our hook. So we go in there and pull up a loop. Go right in there and pull up a loop. And we're going to do this all the way across until there are two stitches remaining. So just keep finding that big space there. You can see I've got a loop coming out of that one. So we go to the next one and pull up our loop. Go ahead and make sure, try and pull those up nice and high. Every once in a while, I like to just kind of give my crochet in the previous row there a tug. Go to the next one, go to the next one. We've got two spaces here. So I'm gonna go into this one. And now, pull up a little bit more yarn here for my skein. We've got those two stitches left here at the end, right? With the Tunisian full stitch, we need to offset our stitches a little bit so that we don't accidentally end up increasing. Since we went between the first and second stitch of this row, we're going to skip going between the last two stitches. Instead, we want to finish off our row with an end stitch, and this is a little different. We see that final stitch right there. If we turn it to the side, you can see how there's two loops here along this edge. So for the edge stitch, we want to actually get those two loops on our hook. Let me pull that out again and show you again, right there. We've got those two stitches left at the end. We're going to skip putting a stitch or pulling up a loop from that space in between. We're going to, from the front, it looks like we're splitting that stitch, but you can see there's two loops there at the end. That's where we want to yarn over and pull up a loop. We treat the ends of our Tunisian forward passes a little bit differently. 
It just gives us so much nicer of a finished edge. And then, of course, we can check our work. We should still have 12 loops on our hook. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Again, that's because I started with 12. If you started with a different number, you should still have that number on your hook as well. So then, our return pass is exactly the same. Tunisian Full Stitch uses the standard return pass. So we yarn over and pull through just that first loop. And then we yarn over and pull through two, yarn over and pull through two, yarn over and pull through two, all the way across until we have just that one last loop on our hook that we pulled through the last two loops. So I'm working my way back across. There we are, got those last two loops, so I yarn over. And then we have finished our first row of Tunisian full stitch. You see, and now we're set up, <clears throat> excuse me, now we're set up with those big spaces again to work this next row. So now the third row is where we need to offset a little bit. We can see, if we look at our work, how that first loop we pulled up in the previous row went between the first and second stitches. And we can also remember, because it was just a moment ago, but on a big blanket, you know, you put it down, you walk away, you might have to go back and look. So look and see, this was the loop right there that we started our row with. This was the first loop that we pulled up and it went between the first and second. So that means for this row, we want to skip that space and go to the next space to create that offset pattern. So for the third row, we'll start pulling up loops between the second and third stitch. Then we just continue doing it in every one across. And this one, we will pull up a loop then between those last two stitches. Again, we want to make sure to maintain our stitch count all the way across. I'm running out of yarn there. Let me pull up a little bit more. I always prefer to keep the tension in my hands rather than using the skein to do it. If you let the skein do it, then as it gets tighter and tighter, your stitches will get smaller and smaller. So it's best to try and control that tension with your hands. So here we are already. We've got those last two stitches there. Let me try and hold that up a little closer. This time we're not going to skip that space because we skipped that first space. And then we want to finish it up the same way. Here's that last stitch. We can see those two strands right along the edge there. So we wanna basically just go right under those two strands along the edge, yarn over and pull up our loop. Straighten that out a little bit there. And now we can make sure again, do we have our correct stitch count? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. That's what I started with. That's how many loops I've got. I know I'm still on the right track. I haven't accidentally increased or decreased. So same return pass. We yarn over and pull through one. Then we yarn over and pull through two. Yarn over and pull through two all the way across until we get to that very last loop. And that is the Tunisian full stitch. We just go back and forth between those two rows. We're either going to skip that last space or we're going to skip the first space. Here we've got that one. And now, hopefully, even though this swatch is quite small, you can see how those strands are sort of becoming offset. Here on our bigger swatch, it's a little easier to see. We can go ahead and make a couple more rows here. But I want you to see how that offsetting gives us that really great woven look. And because we're either skipping just the one at the beginning or at the end, it stays nice and even. So let's do a little bit more. I'm going to make sure I'm not missing any big questions here. Just give me a second. All right. Okay. Looks like there might have been a little trouble with some... Speakers. This is different from the Tunisian Simple Stitch. Somebody asked that. That one is a different stitch. Um, simple Stitch is typically the first one you learn, but I think this one is actually, I think it's a little bit easier, but I guess, uh, guess uh, you know, it depends on which one you like better. Uh, Tunisian Simple Stitch is going into those specific loops, those vertical loops we were talking about, like that, and picking up a stitch picking up a loop that would be Tunisian simple stitch for this one we're going in between those stitches so we've just finished row three let's go ahead and make row four but I'm going to go ahead and switch colors now 
I have not seen in this pattern specific instructions. There they are. I was going to say, they've got to be in the notes somewhere. To join new color, work to last loops on hook of previous color, yarn over with new color, and proceed. So, what do we do when it's time to change colors? Because now we've worked the stitch a little bit, but let's say we want to change our colors, which we want to do quite a bit in this pattern. I'm going to stop on my return pass when I have two loops left on the hook. You can see I went too far before, so I just stuck my hook back there and pulled that one out. Now we've got two loops left on our hook for the return pass. This is where we would bring up our next color. Obviously the designers had much more coordinating colors in their stash. This is just what I had in my stash today. So to introduce our new color for this pattern, when we're down to those last two loops of our return pass, we're going to yarn over with our new color and just pull it on through. And then we can weave that end in. There it is, there's the end when we get to the end of our project. And whether or not you want to break your yarn and weave in your ends as you go or try and carry your yarn along the side is up to you. However, I will point out that this pattern does not have a row of crochet worked along that edge before the fringe is added. So the fringe may hide some of those carries, but in the end, it'll be up to you um, you know, if you want to add maybe a little bit of a border, if you're even interested in the fringe, or if you were going to skip the fringe anyway, it's up to you. Um, but something to think about as you're making your own blanket. So let's, so we've got our hook here, or our loop rather on our hook. It's time to start a row two repeat. So we're going to go in between that first and second row. So now we're just going to go ahead and do that with our new color. And again, we'll weave in those ends when we get to the end of our project, or you can weave them in as you go, however you like to do it but we just start crocheting with our new color here. And now it's maybe even a little bit easier to see in the new color. And I'm going right in between those stitches and pulling up our loop. You can really feel right there for each of those spaces and pull up that loop. Try and remember to pull it nice and high with each stitch. So we pull that up, give it a little tug, Pull that one up, give it a little tug, all the way across. Now we went into that first space, so that means we'll skip our last space. And let's see, there it is, there's that final space. So we want to finish it off by going kind of under those two side loops and yarn over and pull up our loop from there. Make sure we've got the right number of stitches. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And then we work our return pass just as we did before. Yarn over and pull through one, then yarn over and pull through two, yarn over and pull through two, yarn over and pull through two, all the way across. Till we get to that last loop on our hook. Now, if the, it was in the instructions where we needed to change colors again after just one row, then we need to remember we stop with those two loops left on our hook and we can either pull it up if we've kept it attached or yarn over again with whatever the next color is going to be in that color pattern that you're following. So we would yarn over and pull through with our new color. I've just got two colors here today. And then we begin again. In the previous row, now it's a little bit easier to see since it's that other color that we went between the first and second stitch. So now we know we're going to skip to go between the second and third for this row. And then the same thing. We just go right in between, get those little ends out of the way there, and pull up our loop between each of those stitches. And you can see, once you add other colors, or if you're using an ombre, especially if you're you know, doing the full width of the blanket, you're gonna get much more of the striping effect from the ombre than on our little swatch here today. But adding color to this just adds even more interest. And you can really play with the color too. Um, I love the suggestions written out in the written pattern, but if you want to do your color striping a little differently, or like I say, just use ombre for the whole thing or do it in a solid, obviously it's totally up to you. That's the fun of crochet. So for this one, if I've gotten distracted, like I have, because I've been chatting, I can go back and look. I see I went into that between the second and third, my two first stitches are there. So that means I am going to go in. 
between those last two stitches and pull up a loop. And then finally, that very end stitch right there. Just as before. You can see now that we've been doing a few of those rows, just how nice it makes that end or that side of our stitches look when we go under those two side loops like that. And now, of course, we just work it off the same way. Yarn over and pull through that first loop. Yarn over and pull through two. Yarn over and pull through two all the way across. And if you need to change colors again, you'll stop with two loops left on your hook so you can pick up and pull over with that brand new color. There we go. All right. I'm gonna go ahead and finish that one. There we go. And you can see how that just continues to build from there. Now, if you want to go ahead and finish this up, when you've made obviously many, many more rows than this, um, or you know, you could, if you're just practicing, go ahead and make a dishcloth size or maybe a little coaster or a mug rug. But to finish it up, like I said, this one has a little bit of unique finishing. A lot of times with Tunisian crochet, we might do a finishing row that sort of closes up these final gaps up here. This one's going to be a little bit different. And for this, we actually switch to a uh, standard J hook let me see. I forgot to grab one before class. Let me see if I've got one over here. I should have one here. Yes, right here we go. All right. So to finish up this one and get the curling out of there, what we actually do for our final row and then for again across the bottom one here is we add a row of double crochets. Now, double crocheting into a row of Tunisian full stitch can definitely give you a little bit of pause. It's a little bit different. In the notes, it says, working into the horizontal bumps at the back of the foundation chain um, for the first row, but this just says work in the back loop only. So I had to actually reach out to the Yarn Inspiration to Design team and ask them, where is the back loop only in the Tunisian full stitch? It's a phrase I hadn't encountered before. Found out. We want to be looking at the horizontal stitches there in between our vertical loops. With Tunisian, we're looking usually looking at those vertical loops. For finding the back loop only for this row, we want to look at these two right here, the two loops, sort of that V in between our stitches. So we can chain three to start, kind of a standard double crochet there, and then because of the way Tunisian stitches are made and because of the curl, I think an argument could be made that either one of these should be treated as the back loop only. But for this, I really like to go kind of consider it as having curled towards me and just look at the V and say that one right there, the top one, if you will, is the one that is the back loop. So I'm just going to go right under that one right there. Again, it's your project. If you like the look of putting it somewhere else, go for it. Then I find that next horizontal V right there. And I'm going to go under that one right there. Sort of as if I had turned the whole row to look at me. This way, because of the Tunisian curl, I'm going to consider it as already being turned to look at me. So then I just put a double crochet in each of these loops. Now, when we do the same thing on the other side, it's a whole lot easier because we worked into that underneath hump to make our first row we have a really simple very easy to see where that back loop only is on the bottom but we do that all the way across here and then break our yarn and do it all the way across the bottom and then that's where we would fold it over and sew it down so when you break your end at the end of adding this row of double crochet you'll want to leave a long tail then you will fold that over like so. And this is where those T-pins come in handy. So you can pin it down. And then what I like to do is find a row of loops here on the back. This is the back of our Tunisian fabric. And you can see, especially if you're familiar with knitting, kind of looks like a garter stitch. We've just got a whole series here of a straight line of horizontal loops. So what I like to do when I have a project like this is fold it over and then say, okay, this looks like the right, the right spot. This is the row of horizontal loops. So then you can simply use your yarn needle and whip stitch to each one of those loops. Let's go ahead and do, obviously I only have a few stitches here. 
But let's go ahead and do just a few of those here while we still have a few minutes together. I'm going to cut my yarn end. And normally I would cut it at least, you know, twice the length, up to three times the length of where I want to sew. Just to make sure I'll have enough. I'm going to cut this blue one here too to get it out of the way a little bit. And then we'll pretend I had gone all the way across my blanket here. So I'm ready to finish it off. Look, cut my long tail here. So I've got it all set for sewing. And then I will need to grab a yarn needle and put that end right on my needle. There we go. Okay, so then we can use our pins. If we want to set it up ahead of time, I've only got four stitches here, so not a whole lot to pin down. Get that out of the way there. But we would just fold that over to the back of our fabric. Sort of match it up maybe with where we want to sew it down, see how it looks from the front. Do we like the way it looks? Sure. All right. Then we can use those pins. Sort of pin it in place all the way across. Sort of like we would normally use stitch markers, but they don't quite work as well in this circumstance. So whatever pins you have, you can use to pin those in place, and then those be held there while you're sewing. Obviously, as you go, you'll want to pull those out or maybe point them the other direction so you don't accidentally end up poking yourself as you're doing your sewing, there we go. But then, like I say, just find find that row and kind of use that as your guide. That's what I like to do anyway. So we'll say this one right here, I'll just grab that loop with my needle and then go under the top two loops of that last double crochet and pull on through and that's a whip stitch. We Find that next horizontal loop, top of the next stitch and pull that on through. And then you would just do that all the way across. So if you want to, you can use a couple stitch markers to match those up if you want to count them out to make sure they're going to be perfectly lined up as you go across. Or you can just use your pins to hold it in. And you would want to, you know, weave in your ends before you began this part, certainly. And you just sew that on across till you are happy with how well that is sewn down. And then that will help greatly with the curling. Um, again, curling is simply a part of Tunisian crochet. Um, tricks like this, sewing down the edges can help a lot. Blocking is definitely a huge part of it. And it's also the reason we use bigger hooks with Tunisian. Um, normally, Karen Jumbo calls for, well, we saw we used a J hook to do the edging. So normally it even calls for an H hook. But with Tunisian, we use an eight millimeter crochet hook with this yarn because the bigger the hook, the less curling we'll have as well. So then after you've got your end sewn down, you can go ahead and if you'd like, add a little bit of fringe to the sides. There's instructions with that on the pattern, very simple fringe, but of course the fringe is totally optional. If you'd just like to add a simple border, you can do that as well. So let's go ahead, I'm gonna double check and make sure I haven't missed any other questions here. Um, I'm sorry for anybody who's having trouble. It looks like there may have been a couple people having um, audio issues. Um, I will be embedding this video on the Moogly, uh, Moogly blog, basically, <laughs> if you need to watch it again later. Um, recommendations for Tunisian hooks. out Right now, um, there's some wonderful ones out there, um, but everybody is going to have their own preference. If you're just getting started with Tunisian, like I say, I would recommend grabbing your Susan Bates, your nice long straight Susan Bates and giving it a try on that. Um, there are also a few Tunisian hooks um, available from your inspirations on the site. Um, other than that, I would say, like any other hook, it's just a matter of finding what works best for you. Let me see here. Look for any other. And of course, you'll be able to come back and watch this of, on the Yarn Inspirations Facebook page. It should stay up. I just, I tend to not trust Facebook very much. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But it is being recorded. So let's see. Um, so yes, this is the full stitch and the simple stitch goes into a whole different part of the stitch right here. For the full stitch, we go between our stitches. The simple stitch, we pick up our loop under the front loop of those vertical bars. So maybe someday I'll get to come back and teach that one as well. That would be a lot of fun. Yes, this one is really different. It um, creates this really unique woven look that you just don't get typically in crochet. And again, in other colors, when you add the other colors, um, this picture in particular in the pattern has a really good close-up of what that looks with all the beautiful colors of the Karen 
jumbo and one pound. So yeah, I think I think that covers just about everybody's questions. Um, again, sorry for any technical issues. This is being recorded, so you'll be able to go back and watch that later. Um, definitely drop any questions you have. Reach out to me if you have questions as well. I'd be happy to answer. Um, somebody does have a question. I hold my hook like a pencil, but for Tunisian, yep, you do have to hold your hook a little bit like a knife, um, but it causes them a little bit of pain. Now, that's the trouble with Tunisian. You can't really, as far as I know, at least I haven't seen any, I haven't seen what we would call an ergonomic Tunisian crochet hook because of the nature of, you know, the stitches. It really does kind of have to be a long thing. Um, if you are still using straights like this, I would recommend looking into the kind with the cord attached and making sure that the section attached to the cord has a place to rest, whether that's on a table or on your lap or on you know the couch in front of you, wherever you are, give that uh, weight a place to rest. A lot of the wrist pain with Tunisian comes when we're using these long straight needles and we have you know a whole bunch of loops on there and that just, it gets heavy, you know? So with each stitch, we're lifting each one of those loops and working it off. So that's where having the shorter hooks that have the long cables attached can really um, be a big relief. You might not have as much to hold on to, but then you can let that weight fall into your lap and just focus on those few stitches at a time. And hopefully that will help quite a bit with any hand pain that you're having with the Tunisian. Um, and of course, like any other, you know, new skill when we're using our hands a lot, some stretches, you know, really give ourselves a break and a rest every once in a while is important as well. It is a whole new skill. I look for a couple more questions here. Yes, for curling, um, bigger hooks, blocking, and then little tricks like sewing down the sides like this, which I hadn't actually seen uh, before this pattern. So yay, and yes, definitely if you don't have, um, you know, the big long hook, you can do something like a bookmark, a scarf, give it a try, um, a little bracelet, a belt, all these things that you can do, um, even if you don't have the great big hooks yet, you can definitely give the Tunisian full stitch a try. So I think with time, we can go ahead and come back to the other camera. I want to thank you guys so much for joining me for this class today. Again, Karen Jumbo Ombre and Karen One Pound were the yarns we used. Um, sure, you can find ones that coordinate better than these, but not too bad. Uh, and you can definitely have a lot of fun with this pattern. Make it a blanket, make it a placemat, make it a bookmark, whatever um, makes you happy. And definitely do give Tunisian crochet a try. Um, as you can see here, it's not that complicated and it makes really great looking stitches. So thank you so much for joining me and I hope you have a great day and we'll see you next time. Bye everybody.